name is Ora, and our son's real name is Simcha. And together, the twins represent Ora, the Simcha of light and joy, the twin themes of the four of Europe. <laughs> Members of the family will also notice that in English, their names are Abigail and Judah, which means they have the initials A and J. <laughs> Uh, but I'd like to focus the remainder of my remarks on my son's career in Judah. And to introduce my remarks, I'd like to uh, tell a story from the shtetl uh, in Europe. During the community, had a custom of having everyone come up uh, before the Harvest Kodesh in the Eva to, uh, and say what's on their heart. And the rabbi got up and he said, Oi, may have pity on my soul, God. Who am I? I am nothing. I am absolutely nothing. The president of the shul gets up next. And he says, hey, it's good for the rabbi, it's good for me. Oh, ra oh God, please have mercy on my soul. I am nothing. I am absolutely nothing. And then, as the congregation filters forward, the lowly shamish, the wood carrier, he comes in and he says, as well, have mercy on me. I am absolutely nothing. And the president turns to his neighbor and says, hey, who is calling me nothing? <laughs> Uh, about two and a half years ago, uh, a trend began to develop among the alumni of Yeshivat Haratzion in Israel to name their sons after the Rosh Yeshiva of Rabbi Yudah Mikal, who passed away in July 2010 after a distinguished research education and service to the state of Israel. Now, those of you who have known me for some time may be surprised that of all my teachers, I've chosen to memorialize this one in particular. It would be one thing if I sat in his classes for many years, or if I were an educator, or a political leader, who acted out a teaching center with their basis, or if I were to say to the Holocaust survivors, who would have drawn inspiration from his phenomenal faith. But I really none of those things. He was a simple man who learned in his yeshiva for a couple of years, and then came back to the United States. Somewhere, surely somewhere out there, someone is working behind my back, and who was calling himself nothing. And yet, the Gemara about Azara states, Rabbah said, <coughs> A man cannot fully grasp the depth of his teacher's knowledge until he turns 40 years old. The Gemara about Mitzvah Lama Gimel gives us a practical ramification. The Gemara there speaks about who takes priority with respect to giving back or, or making an effort to return lost property. And the Gemara says that when Rabbi a student has to take priority above anybody else to return his rabbi's lost property. Even over his father. Rokhista turned to Rahuna and said, Hey Rahuna, what about a rabbi who needs his student, who is dependent on his student, that the same relationship applies that the student must give the rabbi the same great honor? And her Buddha returned to him and said, you missed the point. I'm relaying, Krista, Krista, don't speak to Krista, you don't need me. I don't need you. I'll be the snake out of her body. She didn't need me until you turned 40 years old. So I still have a head and full head of hair still a little bit of ways to go before I turned 40. But I also have had the benefit of some maturation over the course of the last uh, number of years. And as time goes on, third teachings of our teacher, Rabbi Yudha Mikal, have emerged as central to my worldview. It was not an accident that at my wedding, I found it on one of his papers, where Zakaria speaks about the miracle of the return to Jerusalem, of children and old people dancing together in the streets of Yerushalayim, and God responding that even in God's own eyes, it would be wondrous. And I reflected on the wondrous nature of that event uh, for, my, for myself personally. And today, five years later, I've become a lawyer, and I started to be involved in public affairs. And I come to Rabbi Mikal as a model of religious responsibility, a holiness of public service. For those of you who have not heard of him until today, a good biography. Rabbi Mikal was born in Transylvania, Hungary, in 1924. He was taken to a slave labor camp during the war. He narrowly escaped and he sent to a death camp on a number of occasions. 
His entire family, many friends, his primary teacher, a murder, and a murder. In the early 1945, studying the Shabbat Gadron, fought in the Haganah during the War of Independence. Sometime later, he developed the, the logical and uh, practical grounding for the head of system in which uh, students can buy Torah studies army service. In 1968, he founded Shabbat Gadron. Just a few months after the Six Day War, he served as a Rosh Hashiva for 40 years. He also served as the leader of the Israeli cabinet following the Armenian assassination in 1995, and charged with attempting to bridge the gap between the religious and the secular Jews. It's a famous story that our Rabbi like to tell. And actually, as my son interrupted me at the Paris of our Torah last night, uh, it brought to mind so much more. It's fair to say that the story is famous because of Rabbi Mikal. The story is that the, the founder of Chabad, Shner Zalman of Liadi, known as Malatanya, was studying Torah in a three-room uh, little flat. He was in one room, and the next room over was his grandson, who was in Tzedek Tzedek, of another great Dr. leader. And in the third room, the furthest room, was, was a little baby. At some point, the Balatanya heard the baby cry. He got up, stopped his learning, got up, and he the baby. After comforting the baby, he went to his grandson, he stood up and said, well, why did you comfort the baby? You were closer. And so the grandson said, I didn't hear the baby cry. I was too busy learning. I was engrossed in my learning, I didn't hear the baby cry. The Balatanya taught his grandson any learning that can blot out the sounds of a baby cry. Not that was the, the founding principle of the yeshiva. That the student of the yeshiva has to learn Torah while learning to deprive the baby. In this paper, Rabbi Tal noted that when he set out the plans of the base measures and saw the amount of windows, he insisted that there be multiple, multiple windows in order that people should see and feel the needs of the Jewish people. Every morning, when I walk into my office, I'm on the 36th floor of a very tall building. I look out my window and I reflect on what I'm doing directly in front of me. If I hit a home run with Archimedes' bat, perhaps, I would um, I would go right into the hospital, Hartford Hospital. If I hit a foul ball, I would run to the state capitol and then beyond the state supreme court. Literally every morning, I settle down to my office. I look out the window and ask myself, am I hearing the baby crying? Am I here today? with the needs of the outside world. Yeah. Rabbi Tal mocked religious facts and alternative methods of expressing five-year spirituality. He was very interested in doing things that were not noble. He used to tell us if you want to become a better person or call me Hassan, don't take any shortcuts. In Hebrew, aim patenting. You have to work in yourself, you have to be you have to work hard, you have to be authentic. The spirit line for the davening was the Tahir the Mishnah of the Chab Amet. In other words, purify us that we should serve you authentically in truth and in depth. It's somewhat ironic that my current work, my current work is involved in patenting patents. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, the method is the same. Work hard, be honest, and authentic. In Shakespeare's words, to thine own self be true. And it must fall as night and day, thou shalt not then be false to any man. One final thought. The Kutzka Rebbe, when it comes to the point of the point of don't try to be a holy angel. There are enough holy angels in the world. Instead, try to be a holy person. Hashem is looking for a human being to be holy people. I hope you pray for a dear little Yehuda Sin Club that you should grow up to be an Ishamet and Ish Kodesh. When it starts for spiritual growth and deep connection to Torah. Together we hope that he and his older sister Abigail Ora will provide the Torah days with order to sin called light and joy. And may he too build connection to Torah scholars both from a distance and up close. So that even as he approaches the age of 40, he too will realize that as much as the scholars think can be his perfect devotion, he will need their wisdom even more. And will draw their teachings to forge his path in life. Thank you.